do 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 well, I hope you enjoyed that little detour last week. I'm still trying to figure out why Napoleon and Anne Frank were around in 1912 with the Titanic. But hey, at least that didn't involve a scary-ass Easter Bunny. Once again, I am Johnny C, and I am your guide through this month of retrospectives involving shows with people in a certain cinematic universe. This is It Was a Thing on TV. It's the fall of 2014, and a young ginger from Scotland is fresh off her fan-favorite role as Amy Pond on Doctor Who and just completed her first big major motion picture in James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy. Hey, do you remember that one WWE Films movie that Karen Gillian did in between called Oculus? That movie didn't have any WWE superstars in it. And that's the most acclaimed movie with audiences out of every movie they ever did. Go figure, huh? Anyways, I'm getting off track. ABC tried to capitalize on her popularity with geekdom by casting her as a fame-obsessed dweeb in a sitcom inspired by My Fair Lady and starring in the Henry Higgins role opposite Karen Gillian's Eliza Doolittle is... Harold. From Harold and Kumar? Mr. Sulu? You know, the MILF guy from American Pie. Hey, you know what? It's better, probably, than that Cowboy Bebop Netflix show that John Cho did last year. Yikes. Anyways, let's take a trip back to the year of Captain America, the Winter Soldier, and enjoy Mike, Chico, and Greg talk about... Selfie. Episode 260, submission number 1488, Selfie. Selfie aired from September 13th to December 30th, 2014, for 13 episodes, the first seven of which aired on ABC, and The Back Six, which aired on Hulu. I'm looking at me, and look at me, not to make it all me, funny thing about me, is why I'm looking at me, I'm hoping. Okay, we're back on Marvel Month, folks. But before we do, I'm going to bring out my big book of Nito Keen facts, all right? Pygmalion is a play by George Bernard Shaw named after the Greek mythological figure, which premiered at the Hotburg Theater in Vienna on October 16, 1913. It was first presented in English on stage to the public later that year. Its English language premiere took place at Her Majesty's Theater in the West End on April 14th or April 1914, and starred Herbert Beerborn Tree as phonetics Professor Henry Higgins and Mrs. Patrick Campbell as Cockney Flower Girl Eliza Doolittle. This play, of course, was remade as the legendary musical in 1956 called My Fair Lady, which premiered on Broadway by Lerner and Lowe, starring Rex Harrison as Henry Higgins and Julie Andrews as Eliza. And for you youngins out there, Rex Harrison and My Fair Lady is the inspiration for Stewie Griffin. Yes, he is. Yes, Stewie Griffin's voice and mannerisms are from Rex Harrison. And I just got to say really fast, Pygmalion, My Fair Lady, one of my favorites. Love it. If you've never seen it, you're doing yourself an injustice by not. And of course, Rex Harrison would go on to revive that role on film with Audrey Hepburn playing Eliza. Now, what does all this have to do with a social media obsessed pharmaceutical sales rep? On the surface, not much. Then again, just like Eliza Dooley, there's so much more to this story than meets the eye. Eliza Dooley's a transformer? She's more than meets the eye, Mike. 
Yeah, that's what Chico just said. So selfie, which is basically my fair lady in the modern day, was created by Emily Kapnick based on the Pygmalion story. Her work includes As Told by Ginger and Suburgatory, uh, both of which I don't think are, are right for this podcast. They're too good. Or, you know, they're good enough. Yeah. Concur. She also wrote two episodes of Hung for HBO, which we're never going to cover on this podcast because, again, why would we? Uh, why would we? Even though Aaron Heckard is great, no. In the same year she premiered Suburgatory, she created Selfie, which, again, is based on the My Fair Lady story, and featured two well-known commodities, or at least two up-and-coming commodities, in the two lead roles of Eliza Dooley and Henry Higgs. Playing the role of Eliza Dooley is Karen Gillan, who has just come off of starring as a noted character in some British sci-fi series that you may have heard of. One of Greg's favorites. Yes. I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the show. I'm talking about Karen Gillan. Oh, yeah. The show and the actress are one of my favorites. Yes. Let's just say we, we did cover a movie based on the show on this podcast. That is true, yeah. The um, Doctor Who TV movie from 96. But also, hey, again, I guess got to say this. Chameleon. He was not a robot. Even no. though he looked like a robot. And he was indeed played by a robot. It was not a robot. And we also can't forget about K-9. We just talked about him last week, I believe, in previewing this episode. Yeah, K-9 and company. Yeah. We talked yep. about it in previous episode, yes. But of course, nowadays, you can find her in the universe playing the role of Nebula, who is a beleaguered part of the Guardians of the Galaxy. In fact, this was 2014, the year of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 1. Mm -hmm. That came out in 2014. Oh, and hey, Karen Gillan's going to be in uh, Thor Love and Thunder, because remember... Chico, at the end of Endgame, Thor traveled with the Guardians, so we are going to... Not the Cleveland Guardians. Not those Guardians, Mike. The Guardians of the Galaxy. The other Guardians. Hey, speaking of the Guardians... Oh, hold on. It, Should we play the CNN breaking news bumper? Yep. No, no, you don't have to play it. For our, our listeners, if you haven't seen Tom Hanks throw out the first pitch at the Guardians home opener on Friday uh, the 15th, you're you owe it to yourself an injustice. To, you're doing you owe it to yourself. To, yeah, yeah. You owe it to yourself to uh, seek that out. Yeah, we watched it. It was hilarious. Let's just say Wilson is not a fan of the mound. Wilson stole the show. Yep. Wilson. <laughs> but yeah, Karen Gillan will be with the Guardians of the Galaxy in Thor: Love and Thunder. Cannot wait for that. She's also going to be in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, because of course she is. Yeah, next year. The long-awaited... It seems like it's been 50 years since Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. I know, right? This is the Duke Nukem Forever of the MCU. We've been waiting for this to come out forever. Thanks a lot, Twitter trolls, for postponing this, like, another three years. But at least we got Peacemaker out of it. And the Suicide True. Squad. True. And we all loved Peacemaker. Even though we did. even though in Peacemaker I couldn't see the main character throughout the whole show. What was that about? I don't know. If you want to reminisce about Greg being flummoxed by the lack of a lead character in Peacemaker, you can go back to the live watch. Yeah. You sure you don't need your eyes checked there, Greg? <sighs> it's so weird. It's like Every time I go to the toy aisle, whenever I see WWE figures, there's always a blank spot there. I don't get it. Oh, my eyes, they're just playing tricks on me. Yeah. <laughs> and the second lead character, Henry Higgs, is played by John Cho, 
who was more noted for playing Harold in the Harold and Kumar movies, playing Lieutenant Hikaru Sulu in the Abrams Star Trek movies, and playing Spike Spiegel in Future Entry Cowboy Bebop. We're not going to talk about him being the MILF guy in American Pie. He was the MILF guy in American Pie? Yeah, he was! You don't remember that? I do not remember this. Yes, that was like his first big role. <laughs> oh yeah, I think he played like a busboy in Bowfinger. You remember Bowfinger? See, I remember Bowfinger, no problem. Oh, you know whose house was in Bowfinger? Whose house was in Bowfinger? Robert Downey Jr. was in Bowfinger. <laughs> Tie this back into Marvel Month. It's coming full circle. Why don't you just tell the good people the rest of the schedule, huh? That won't be for another two weeks from now, Chico. <laughs> he was also a pizza delivery man on Future Entry, the Jeff Foxworthy show. Yeah, the Jeff Foxworthy show. I forgot about that. <laughs> With a young Haley Joel Osment and a young Jonathan Lipnicki. Oh, my, by the way, future Celebrity Wheel of Fortune contested Haley Joel Osment because he was on Celebrity Wheel of Fortune this year. He was on Celebrity Wheel of Fortune this year. <laughs> oh, by the way, I almost did not recognize him in Future Man because, again, when Beard. he's on... Beard. And also very short. Very short and with a beard. Okay, but we're getting off track here. Let's go yeah. back to... <laughs> There's a lot more to unpack about this show. Play the role of Shermanique Whitaker is David Joy Randolph and Shermanique is... Who is Shermanique? Damned if I know. I'm sure we'll meet Charmonique momentarily, but Devine Joy Randolph, she's known as Oda Mae Brown in the Broadway production of Ghost, the musical. The musical based on the Patrick Swayze Demi Moore movie Ghost, which I didn't even know they made a musical about. They totally made a musical about it. And nowadays, she can be seen as Lady Reed in the biological film Dolomite Is My Name. And in Office Christmas Party. Ooh, office Christmas Party. And she plays VZ in season four of The Last OG. So there you go. Oh, with Tracy Morgan. Yeah. And then the role of Eliza's nerdy neighbor, Bryn, is Alan Rachel, who nowadays can be seen in such films as A Million Ways to Die in the West. Million Dollar Arm, Kong Skull Island, and Valley Girl, as well as one of the roles in B and Puppy Cat. She plays B. Hold on, you mentioned uh, Kong Skull Island? I mentioned Kong Skull Island. No, 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 no. That is not what it's called. Yeah, yeah. What's the correct title of the movie? Oh, boy. Oh, also, she's in the movie King Kong. He got love with her. That's how he makes sex with her. She's young, she's small, and here big. I don't know. <laughs> hey, if we want to tie back in, we'll be talking about Brie Larson next week, so. Yep. And the last member of the main cast is Sam Saperstein, the chairman of Kinder Care Pharmaceuticals, played by David Harewood, who you would more likely remember as uh, Martian Manhunter on Supergirl. Well, that's right, Martian Manhunter. Yep. Fun fact, Mike, he appeared on Celebrity Masterminds on the BBC with the specialist subject, Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials. And I think is the first time we've made a reference to Mastermind, or even Celebrity Mastermind for that matter. Yeah, because when would we ever bring up Mastermind on this show? I don't um, know. Valid question. But yeah, British National. Oh, he also played Joshua Naismith in The End of Time, Greg. 
Oh, wait. So he would have been with um, Timothy Dalton in that? Yes. Would he have been one of the Time Lords in the end of time? No, Joshua Naismith, I think, is somebody else. Oh, okay. I will say, Timothy Dalton in the end of time, he gave a Tony Shalhoub esque performance. I would say we would have more of a Tony Shalhoub performance on Supergirl, but that's just me. And that's the main cast. And then you have a whole boatload of recurring players. We have Giacomo Giannotti as Freddy, Eliza's boyfriend, based on Freddy Ainsford Hill, Eliza Doolittle's boyfriend. Giacomo Giannotti, of course, nowadays can be seen on Station 19. Allison Miller as Julia Hauser, a pediatric urologist that Henry dated. We're actually going to bring her up sometime down the line because she's in future entries Go On and Terra Nova and also Kings. She just might be a future Hall of Famer. I don't know. So Chico, you said it's Go On? Go On, yep, with Matthew Perry. Okay, Okay. I just want to make sure you didn't mean Goon like Ryan Lochte or rather Seth MacFarlane portraying Ryan Lochte on SNL. I think we have footage of it. Yep. So what other new shows do you like? Uh, I'm really excited about that show, Goon. Oh, no. no, no. <laughs> That's actually go on. It's two words. Ah, uh, okay. It's... It's either way, it looks really go odd. No, that's good. That's that's one word. Uh, okay. Uh, I, get, I give it six swims. Okay, that's good. <laughs> six swims, he gave go on. He gives it six swims. Reference, what would Ryan Lochte do, which we covered last year? <laughs> Spoiler right. alert. Brian Lockett well, likes to pee in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then we have Terrence, a kinder care office floater, later promoted to customer service, who marries Sam's daughter, Marine, in the pilot episode, becoming the son-in-law of Sam and Yasmin Saperstein, played by Sam Levine of Freaks and Geeks fame. And if you don't know who Sam Levine is or Freaks and Geeks... Just go away. Just, no. Just no. go. Get out. And actually, if you don't know what Freaks and Geeks is, they just started showing it on Pluto TV. I just saw an ad pop up for it on Facebook earlier today. Yeah, because Freaks and Geeks was produced by DreamWorks, which means DreamWorks, the studio is now owned by Paramount, which means... I thought DreamWorks was owned by NBC Universal. No, that's the animation studio. Okay. Oh, the studio. The, anim- the animate the studio studio. The actual DreamWorks SKG itself is owned oh, by okay. Paramount now. So, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So, and Paramount is part of Pluto TV, so it makes perfect sense why they would air Freaks and Geeks. Makes a ton of sense. Totally. While we're on the subject of Terrence and uh, his wife Marine, his wife Marine is played by Haley Marie Norman who you would best remember, Mike, as Case 25. And if you listened to the preview last week, we thought she was... No, I'm sorry, we shouldn't say we. I thought she was 17. Egad. But it turns... Well, I think she's a little older, but... Yeah. But it turns out she's actually two months older than me. Something (laughs) like that. Yeah. But she's made a very nice career for herself uh, doing acting. Oh, yeah. She's scored recurring roles in AP Bio, Keenan, The Upshaws, and iZombie. And another show that I've seen her on uh, a couple of times, and we've talked about it in the past, sad that it's not doing new shows, Adam ruins everything. Sadly, she'll always be the second most famous briefcase girl from Deal or No Deal. And we no! Have... Claudia! No! No! no. Uh, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. What? I'm sorry. What? Excuse me. When Top one five. of them marries... Not, not number one. Top five. Top five. At least number I three. I said she's the second most famous briefcase girl. Because we all know who number one is. Yeah. She, she married Prince Harry. Yeah, and the second most famous is Claudia Jordan. She's a housewife. 
Yeah, challenge She's us. a real housewife. Challenge us on that. Yeah. Come at me, bro. Right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm... And then you have, as Henry's assistant, Charlie, Maddie Cotteropol, who was in Jurassic World, Stranger Things, and the hedge person of indeterminate gender in uh, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events on Netflix. The Neil Patrick Harris series. Yes. Oh, yeah, tie it back in with John Cho, because we all know NPH was so great in the Harold and Kumar movies. Then you have as Larry, one of the uh, lab techs at Kinder Care, Brian Husky, Come on, best week ever. You don't know who, you yeah, don't know who the, Brian Husky is? The, the original best week ever. Let's say that. Not, not the, the crappy reboot. Not the crappy mm. reboot. No, the good best week ever. No, the one with like Paul F. Tompkins. Yeah, that Paul one. Sheer. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, come on. And then you have Bryn's friends and members of the book club. Prue, Wren, Islet, and Thistle. Those are Thistle. their names, folks. Those are their names, folks. Played by virtual unknowns Kelsey Ford, Colleen Smith, Amanda Jane Cooper, and Sapir Azaway. And Henry's friend at Kinder Care, Ethan, who was promoted in the show but left the show afterwards, was played by Tim Pepper. Who no nowadays. No relation to Gordon. No relation to Gordon Pepper. Yeah, Tim Pepper has not worked since 2015's complication. Gordon Pepper has never had a day off in his life. And that's why we love Gordon Pepper. And he's not wrong, though. Gordon works like 24-7. He's a hustle, baby. You already know. He hustles more than Rocky Johnson on Young Rock Season 2. I've seen this. I can I can confirm selling stolen electronics from the Circuit City fan. Okay, so we have a whole lot of characters here, and what do they have to do with Eliza's world? Well, it's all flushed out in the pilot because any good story is flushed out in the pilot. We have Eliza Dooley who lives on social media, and she's just this absolute narcissist who is determined to become viral. Well, be careful what you wish for, friends. Because she experiences travel sickness, throws up in a bag, and that bag disintegrates right in front of her. Uh Uh-oh! Uh-oh. Hey, Greg, you know that today, the day that we're recording the show, is the 110th anniversary of the Titanic sinking? Yeah, yes. You know what Su- that you do the uh oh. Yeah. You know what Susan St. James's reaction was when she saw Tidy? Uh oh. Uh oh. I thought it was stop the madness. Anyway. <laughs> okay, so she throws up, but we don't know why she threw up because oh wait, now we do, because she found out the man she slept with often was married. What? So, suffice it to say, Eliza Dooley is not living her best life. As it would happen on board the plane is her successful marketing rep, co-worker Henry Higgs, who expresses his extreme dislike for social media and those who use it constantly. Well, I agree with Henry. It's terrible. That's terrible. Yep. He's not wrong. He he, was ahead of the curve in 2014 about how bad social media is. Yep. After being the subject of humiliation when her sickness bag explodes over her, she decides to seek his help after discovering that her social media popularity does not translate into offline friendships. I'm shocked. Shocked. He begins by getting Eliza to ask people how they are instead of just talking about how she is and to make pleasant conversation. When Henry invites Eliza to his boss's daughter's wedding, she requests the help of her nerdy neighbor, Bryn, to find something suitable to wear. However, after the wedding, where Eliza uses her phone to play games, the two argue. 
Eliza calls Henry an antisocial, judgmental, critical workaholic, and Henry calls Eliza a lost cause. Eliza shares a conversation with receptionist Charmonique about someone and something other than herself, and Charmonique compliments her, stating that whatever she was doing with Henry was working. Afterwards, Eliza finds Henry at his house and apologizes for her earlier remarks and actions, and the two become friends again. That's nice. Episode 2. Untag My Heart. Eliza explains the use of social media to Henry. After finding her flirting with Freddie, another employee, Henry forces Eliza to think about how she is perceived in the office. After observing the key points of her relationship with Freddie, she comes to realize she is no more than a booty call for him. What? Taking advice from one another, Eliza attempts to obtain a hobby other than casual sex. Was it coupling a couple of years ago? Anyway... When Henry creates a Facebook account, Henry finds that social media is addictive and Eliza needs help getting Freddie to think about her more seriously. Eliza decides to take on a club, so she decides to join in on her book club, though she is quickly found out as not having read the book. Meanwhile, after being warned not to by Eliza, Henry starts to look in on his ex-girlfriends on Facebook. He then visits one at her house to apologize for tagging himself in her photo as her baby by accident due to Henry having no Facebook experience. Oh no. After deciding that having sex with Freddy would give her the strength to not have sex with Freddy again. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. Eliza gets hit by a car and falls down a manhole before getting admitted to a hospital. Oh, God. There's <laughs> where the uh-oh should go. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, no. Henry checks in on Eliza, but ends up accidentally tagging himself in one of her photos as a pet. <laughs> Henry promptly deletes his account. Freddie also visits Eliza, but instead of being a booty call, Freddie simply wants to make sure that if she needs a lift or help, He's there for her. Oh. Hey, this we do have what... a name. We do have a name oh, in this episode. Who, who do we have in this episode? In this episode, playing Denise is Verne Watson. Oh, and, oh, uh, Will's say mama. It, Go. Uh, she's by on the Fresh Prince. She's Will's mama. That's it. And also, we talked about her in the past because she was on Carter Country. That's right. We don't like talking about that episode for obvious reasons. No. Yeah, she, she was a regular yeah. in Carter Country. Yeah. We don't talk about Carter Country. Oh. No, no, no. And by the way, since you mentioned Fresh Prince of Bel Air, slap. Ha! He got it. Take him again. Re re reference what happened a few weeks ago. Yeah. 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 We, we get it. We get it. Yeah. Yeah. Episode three. A little yelp from my friends. Henry is continuing oh, to try to get a yeah. It doesn't get any better, folks. Henry is continuing to try to get Eliza to talk to people instead of using her phone continuously, but his project on her still isn't working. Sam Seprestein orders his employees to work on their interpersonal connectivity, initially by getting them to rate their connection on a scale up to 10 with the employees sitting next to them. All goes well up until Joan, a fellow employee who saws a grudge against her, gives Eliza a zero. Though she believes that Eliza is bound to not notice since she's always staring at her phone. This is due to after having found herself extremely hungry, Eliza had eaten Joan's gazpacho. This leads Henry and Eliza to the realization that the most valuable office relationship is with each other and Henry gives Eliza the job of befriending Joan. Eliza tries to be friends with Joan by stalking her Yelp account with the help of Charmonique and attends one of the dance classes that she attends. Eliza is eventually caught out by Joan about her Yelp stalking and admits she was just trying to get to know her. Meanwhile, Larry attempts to get closer to Henry after his wife leaves him, which Henry finds awkwardly frustrating, given that he's not an overly social person. 
Henry convinces Larry that his penchant for flash mobs won't get his wife back and that a simpler gesture would work. Larry buys flowers and his wife appreciates this. However, Raj from Kindercare's HR department commences with the flash mob anyway. To Larry's horror. By the way, uh, Nikhil Pai plays Raj. He's another up and comer. And uh, so far as I know, no names of any notes on this episode. No, I didn't see any names. But we have a name on the fourth episode. Mm -hmm. Episode four, Nugget of Wisdom. Henry challenges Eliza to help others during the weekend, so she offers to babysit Charmonique's young son, Kevin, while Charmonique is at her high school reunion in an attempt to reconnect with Mitchell McMoney, her high school sweetheart. However, Mitchell has become a priest and spends the evening berating Charmonique for having a child out of wedlock. Charmonique realizes that she's a great mother to Kevin, tells Mitchell she regrets nothing about her life choices, and that she loves herself. Charmonique ends up dancing by herself at the reunion, but does so happily. While babysitting Kevin, Eliza tries to one-up Brett, a fellow socialite. Henry tries to come up with a way to improve a chewable vitamin that put Kinder Care Pharmaceuticals on the map. Hey, Chico, I mm-hmm. made a little mistake. We don't mm-hmm. have one name in this episode. We got a couple. First of all, playing the role of Kevin is Keith L. Williams, who you would probably know from Good Boys. He plays Lucas on that. I wasn't even talking about him. Second name, uh, play the role of Fit Brett. Amber Rose, yes, that Amber Rose. Famous for no f***ing reason at all. (laughs) I have no idea idea who Amber Rose is. You don't know who Amber Rose is? No. Everybody knows who Amber Rose is. I thought I was the whitest person in this chat. Who's Amber Rose? I don't know. Yo, uh, I'm talking about Dish Nation, Hip Hop Squares. Okay, I don't watch this. Dancing nation. with the stars. Kanye's ex. That, and that Kanye's Amber- ex. Let's just say it. Kanye's ex. Oh, she, uh, Kanye's ex who's not Kim. Y- yes, Kanye's ex. Yeah. Kanye's ex who's not currently dating Pete Davidson. Okay, yeah. okay. All right. Now, I did not know she was Kanye's ex. Kanye's ex in the sense that they dated. But yeah, she is a known commodity. Unless we're talking about you two. But. You didn't know that, she was Kanye's ex. I didn't know she was yeah. Kanye. Wait, don't say she's a known commodity besides you two. When I just like, uh, you know, identified her. No, only Greg doesn't know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't care less about what Kanye does in his personal life. Or anything for Kanye, that matter. Okay, but play the role of Mitchell McMuddy. Hello, ladies. Look at your man. Now back to me. Now back at your man. Now back to me. Sadly, he isn't me. But if he used this old spice body gel, he could smell like he's me. Look down. Back up. You're, where are you? You're on a boat with the man your man could smell like. I'm on a horse. Yep. Isaiah Mustafa. The man your man could smell like. In other words, if you don't know, the guy, the shirtless guy from the Old Spice commercials. Yes. The one that's not Terry Crews, because as we all know. (laughs) (laughs) I don't want to let this commercial in. <laughs> yeah, Isaiah Mustafa started doing the Old Spice commercials after Terry Crews got popular and famous. And then they did commercials together. Yes, they did. They did do commercials together, and it was great too. <laughs> it, was, it was incredible. It was incredible. But sadly, they did not both kick buildings and explosions. No. No, Isaiah Mustafa just spent his time conjuring things. Only to have Terry Crews kick them 
out of existence. I <laughs> love the fact that he just <laughs> he just kicked with his bare feet Terry Crews a building and made it explode. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 5. Even Hell has two bars. Sam Saperstein invites Eliza and Henry to spend the weekend at his Santa Barbara estate. Henry uses the opportunity to aim for a promotion, while Eliza tries to loosen up the other guests, which only foils Henry's attempt to prove to himself. Henry gets the promotion, though, and the two reconcile with Henry admitting to have, wait for it, grown accustomed to her face. Oh, jeez. Oh, Come oh, on. Oh, I get it, because that's in My Fair Lady. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, though, that this episode aired before the next one, because it was actually supposed to air after the next one. They actually aired on the same night. What? It was an hour-long block of episodes, but they swapped the two. So if you watch this episode first, you're going to hear some things that directly relates to the previous episode, but hasn't happened yet. I'll explain as I go into... Well, actually, let's see if um, this episode has any names for... Oh my god, it does! Playing the role of Yasmin Saperstein, a.k.a. Sam Saperstein's wife, a.k.a. Marine's mama, Natasha Henstridge. Oh, that Natasha Henstridge. Oh, yeah. You know her. You love her. From the Species movies and future entries, She Spies. Oh, She Spies. Can't wait for we cover that one day. But you know what? Whenever I saw her in Species, <laughs> that's eugenics. So, Chico, you said that Natasha Henstridge is playing uh, uh, Haley Marie uh, Norman's mom on this? I did. It's kind of creepy when you think about it because Natasha Henstridge is like nine years older than her. Oh, good time syndrome. I get it. Right, right. You know exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. All right, the next episode, Never Block Cookies. I T. get S. it, Never Block Cookies. <laughs> See how stressed Henry is, Eliza and Charbonique try to liven up his love life. In the process of getting Henry ready for, unbeknownst to him, a night out with dozens of potential dates, Eliza and Henry share a possible spark of romance, which they both quickly ignore. Upon realizing what Eliza and Charmonique had planned, Henry storms out, but runs into Julia, a woman who is as stiff and socially awkward as he is. They leave together. Terrence tries to seek the approval of his father-in-law, Sam Saperstein. Upon realizing that Terrence does not become angry, Sam even tells Terrence that Terrence is not good enough to be married to Sam's daughter. Sam decides that such a personality is well-suited for customer service and promotes him. So you understand why this episode would have had to be seen before the last one. Because the last one directly references events that happened in this one. Yeah, big lack of continuity there. Here we see an appearance of Allison Miller as Julia, so there you go. And episode seven, here's this guy. Henry begins a courtship with Julia, a pediatric urologist, eliciting jealousy from Eliza over the decreasing time they share together. After Eliza posts immature comments about Julia on a review site for doctors, Henry calls off his sessions with Eliza, who is preparing to introduce a speaker at a pharmaceutical conference. Eliza apologizes to Julia and bakes her a cake in the shape of the human urinary tract, upon which the two come to an understanding, if not a friendship. After making the introduction, Eliza finds that Henry did attend after all and cries with happiness when he agrees to continue their lessons. I want to know where they find that cake mold. I think she would just have to, uh, you know, be very very creative with it. 
You've seen, is it cake on Netflix? They can make a cake as anything. I don't get Netflix, but I've seen previews. By the way, is it cake? Phenomenal. Now, before we continue, we should let you know that the premiere ratings for this show were in the 5 million range. And then they dropped almost precipitously to a 3.25, prompting ABC to yank the rest of the show. And in a not unprecedented move, but definitely a rare move, they decided they're going to air the rest of the show online via Hulu and WatchABC.com. This next episode is the first ones. Now, they were released as they were going to be released in a weekly format. So this is actually one of the first shows to be released weekly on a streaming service. After it got canceled. After it got canceled. Which... In 2014, that was like a new thing. Like, what? Because whenever something in the past, when some show had unaired episodes, we'd never see them. But thanks to the internet, we could. Episode 8, Traumatic Party Stress Disorder. For Henry's 40th birthday, Eliza gets some tickets to see his favorite band, Blues Traveler. The concert creates friction between him and his girlfriend, Julia, who is turned off by Henry's outgoing side being brought out by the music. Eliza also throws Henry a surprise birthday party, inviting the kinder care staff while he is aware, or is it kinder care? Probably kinder. Yeah, yeah, I think I've seen it kinder care pronounced sometimes. Okay, anyway. Surprise party while he is away at the concert. Upon arrival, he's upset with Julia having left. While Henry regrets yelling at Eliza and his co-workers, Julia returns later and admits her own discomfort. She admits that she can be cold at times, but that she's dedicated to their relationship and upon kissing Henry, offers to spend the night. The next day, Henry admits to Eliza that he had a very happy birthday. Boing. <laughs> That's eugenics. <laughs> Hey, before we go on, we got a name in this episode. Playing Wayne is Ron Funches. Oh! Yeah, Ooh, that Ron nice. Funches. That's great. Yeah, he's a very well-known comic. Uh, he's been on a number of shows. Frequent appearances on At Midnight and Conan. You'd know him if you saw him. And he's lost like a ton of weight over the last like four or five years. Yeah. And Ron Funches is the voice of King Shark on Harley Quinn, which airs on HBO Max, the animated series based on the character, of course. Episode 9, Follow Through. Henry convinces Eliza to follow through on her good ideas, specifically about a way to boost diaper cream sales. Upon getting asked to meet his parents, Eliza realizes that her relationship with Freddy is getting serious, which freaks her out. Meanwhile, after turning down the advances of Ren, one of Bryn's friends, Henry tries to convince Bryn to make Sam's favorite sandwich, which was being withheld. At dinner with Freddy's parents, Eliza realizes that her relationship with Freddy isn't really love and breaks up with him. Back in her apartment elevator, she thinks about her friendship with Henry and the memories of her and Henry. Now Henry is her only true ally who would always be there for her. When the elevator door opens, Henry is there, having come to apologize to Ren during a book club meeting. Eliza, seductively on the other side of the elevator, reveals herself in front of Henry, following through on her idea that the two of them could be together. Henry freaks out and leaves, but Eliza decides not to get discouraged and vows to continue to follow through. She can't believe she followed through like that, though. Okay, we have... One sort of semi kind of sort of name in this episode playing the role of Maisie is Trisha O'Kelly, who has been in recurring episodes of actually, she's been in all 88 episodes of The New Adventures of Old Christine as Marley and has since been, uh, been in episodes of The Secret Life of the American Teenager, The Mick, 
and Saved by the Bell. The, the Peacock. Re- the reboot. Yeah. yeah. And to tie it back in, the new adventures of old Christine to this theme of who played Christine's ex in the new adventures of old Christine. Chico. It's not coming to me. Sorry. Clark Gregg. Ah. Well, you don't even have to go that far because remember, essentially, Lee Dreyfus, a power broker. Well, no, not technically a power broker. That's the girl from Scandal. No, she just happens to run whatever it is she's doing with John Walker and Yelena. I don't know where that's going to lead to, but... It's going to be fun trying to figure that one out. Episode 10, Imperfect Harmony. Eliza attempts to find out Henry's feelings toward her, and in one confrontation, she admits to have fallen in love with him. Henry is in denial of his own obvious feelings toward Eliza, while also doubting that Eliza has any real feelings toward him. Henry decides that the risk is worth it to pursue a relationship with Eliza, but backs off after talking to a drunk Freddy at an office party. Henry wonders if a fear of commitment is why Eliza dumped Freddy and is pursuing him instead. Eliza is insulted by this theory and tells Henry that she can see through his own relationship with Julia and how he is not in love with her. Julia, who is going to surprise Henry at the party, overhears and exits. Henry claims to be following after her, causing Eliza to revert to her party girl mentality, drinking heavily and ending up in bed with Freddy again. It's always the beds with her. Henry, meanwhile, has not gone after Julia and begins to regret his choice of not being with Eliza. Episode 11, Perestroika. Tensions begins to brew in the workplace between the two after Henry cannot reciprocate his feelings toward Eliza. A dire financial situation befalls her due to her reckless spending, which forces her to be evicted from her apartment. With no one to turn to, she seeks out Henry's help on her finances to control her spending, which in turn reconciles their friendship between them. Eliza and Julia have an unexpected confrontation, leading Eliza to realize that Henry and Julia are no longer a couple. Meanwhile, Eliza and Freddy decide to take their relationship to a more serious stage. Episode 12, which is either called Psyche or Stick in the Mud, based on your source. Eliza's sister Bethany visits. This reveals a childhood sibling rivalry once shared between them, which Eliza is unable to let go. Kinder Care Pharmaceuticals holds its annual charity event, but decides to forego the usual 10-kilometer run for an obstacle mud run. This displeases Henry, as this event is Freddy's forte. Eliza suggests that Freddy mentor him on this event. During training, Freddy cannot help but harbor animosity toward Henry, and their fighting during the actual race allows Charmonique to pull off a surprise win. An important lesson is learned throughout this ordeal, in which differences are overcome between Henry and Freddy, as well as Eliza and Bethany. Playing the role of Bethany is Stephanie Koenig, who is best known for her role as Karen in The Gay and Wondrous Life of Caleb Gallo, Eve in Swedish Dicks, and Sabrina Oslowich in The Flight Attendant. I believe the first two are web series. And, and The, the Flight second... Attendant is on HBO Max. Yeah. So if you ask me, she's moving up in the world. Finally, episode 13, I woke up like this. With Henry's help, Eliza confronts her old school rival, Corinne McWaters, who has been selling a book in which she claims the unpopularity loneliness, and bullying that Corinne had in fact inflicted upon Eliza during middle school. Through this, Eliza learns to accept and embrace her former, more awkward self and to see herself as a role model given how far she's come in life. Henry has challenged himself to skateboard on a ramp after merely having pretended to be a skateboarder ever since high school. Breaking an arm in the process, he now sports a cast with no fear written on it. It's a beautiful day for skydiving! Tell him how to do it, Bonehead! Shoot the skydive! Hey, wait now! I've never done this before! Is my parachute on? Where's my victory? Shut up and jump! And reflects upon his adventures with Eliza. Henry decides that he has the courage to eventually express his feelings to Eliza, but will wait until the right time. 
play the role of Corinne McWaters in this episode is Julianne Gill, who is best known as Becca Riley in Bravo's Girlfriend's Guide to Divorce, Jesse Nevin in Fox's The Resident, Madison Penrose in My Super Psycho Sweet 16, and Christy on Glory Days. You know, they clearly didn't see the writing on the wall. He's going to eventually express his feelings, but wait until the right time. 13 episodes are done there, uh, Henry. <laughs> We're never going to know how you feel about her. No uh, closure. Uh, no closure. Yeah, that's an uh oh moment right there. Yes. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yep. No closure whatsoever. Because this was indeed the last of the 13 episodes produced. So we've had some talented writing. We have talented actors. So what happened? Look at the competition. I'm looking at the competition. Uh, They released the pilot on Twitter, which would have been unheard of at that time. But then again, when it premiered on September 30th, it was up against... Oh, Jesus. Jesus. It was up against NCIS on CBS, The Voice on NBC, and The Flash on The CW. Wait, 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 wait. You forgot one show. Wait, I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. It was also up against Utopia on Fox, which would not have yet been a thing on TV, but is really, really getting close at that point. But then again... They later changed to Master Chef Junior for some reason. And again, the reason I referenced that, I, I said you forgot one. We did talk about Utopia previously. We did. But all 13 episodes did air linearly in Latin America, Southeast Asia, South Africa, Sweden, the Philippines, India. And Poland. And Australia. No, actually, in Australia, it premiered on streaming. Well, at least they got it. They did get it. One thing that they didn't get was any sort of home video release. It wasn't on Hulu for long, I don't think. And ABC has not released it on home video. No, not on DVD, not a Blu-ray release, nothing. You can't even get this on iTunes. I looked. Of course, if you want to uh, try and seek out the episodes, there are maybe a handful on this here internet, thanks to the likes of Daily Motion and YouTube. But do not weep for the careers of Karen Gillan and John Cho. They're doing fine. They're doing fine. Karen Gillan scored the Guardians of the Galaxy role that year, and she is firmly entrenched in the universe. John Cho was in Star Trek and its sequels. And of course, we did do Cowboy Beeblop. Beeblop. Yeah, Cowboy Beeblop. That might as well is what it should have been called. But you know what? They are, I think, working on the next Star Trek movie right now. So Mm -hmm. he will get some work soon. So, And um, interesting thing, it's like, This whole show just needs to happen in real time. And I guess the production of the show also happened in real time because they wanted to, first of all, they wanted to cast an Englishman as Henry Higgs, but couldn't find one as good as John Cho, who's not an Englishman. No. But hey, it didn't really matter because... He made that role as best as he could. He's John Cho, of course. And then you have the sixth episode, Never Block Cookies. It aired before the cancellation was announced, and the writer of that episode, Brian Rubenstein, said that he had a plan for what the next 13 episodes was going to be. But I can't for the life of me think of it right now. He did slip in an intimate moment leading to an almost kiss. And he remembered that moment in particular, saying, Emily came down, that's Emily Kaptick, came down, was sort of orchestrating how that whole thing would go. Just the chemistry between those two was really cool to watch. And it felt that way on set. 
after the show was canceled in the most meta moment in media of the last 10 years, fans began a save selfie campaign on social media. That's right. The fans went to work starting to trend the hashtag save selfie, keeping the television show on the air. A fan from Kentucky created a change.org petition for a second season renewal with over 65,000 supporters. Oh yeah. Cause that really is the big barometer on the internet, a change.org petition. Cause as we all know, if you sign enough signatures on change.org, you can just reverse anything on change.org. A change.org petition is the equivalent of Michael Scott saying, I declare bankruptcy. I declare bankruptcy! Another move was fan media, contests, and fundraisers for charity, including $1,000 being raised for UNICEF on CrowdRise, later acquired by GoFundMe, in honor of Henry Higgs, who regularly donates to UNICEF. The seventh episode would be the last episode that aired on network television. And on that same day, the founder of Media Action Network for Asian Americans, Guy Aoki, pitched in to help with the cause by contacting ABC President Paul Lee and diversity head Tim McNeil, inquiring what could be done to save the show. While Lee was a big champion of the sitcom, the ratings numbers were not there. When sponsors place ads on a television program, the network guarantees a target number. If it does not reach the audience's target number, the network would have to refund the money to the sponsors and end up losing the money. The next step would be to ask advertisers to be patient to give the series a chance to grow, but the ABC network did not give any more opportunities to broadcast the rest of the episodes. Unfortunately, once we make those decisions, it's impossible to go back on them. It was a very difficult decision because it was a very, very good show. So basically, we have a case of ABC over-promising and under-delivering. That doesn't happen often enough, does it? Like what? I don't know. A network over-promising something and under-delivering on that something? I could say something, but I don't want to irritate Greg. Well, what? What? The famous Teddy Z. Oh, that is true, yeah. But we'll talk about that next month. Why would I be upset about that? Just because it was my money in the bank doesn't mean I have an attachment to it. TVTropes.com does list this show as having been screwed by the network. It arguably had little chance being put in ABC's infamous Tuesday night death slot. Yeah, you put a show up against NCIS, not named The Voice or The Bachelor, nobody's gonna watch it. Nope. Now, wait a second. We can make cases for, like, Fresh Off the Boat. Oh, that is true. And Fresh Off the Boat is great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, So, I mean, some shows did survive there. But yeah, not this one. No. No, no. This did not have Randall Park or Constance Wu, so. Mm -mm. But yeah, uh, the show as it aired, when it first aired the pilot, people were called to it with uh, Entertainment Weekly saying the first episode could be a decent show trapped within selfie. Too bad the show's cruel sense of humor and reliance on instantly dated reference may very well drive away viewers before they can see what selfie and Eliza become. But ultimately, it grew to the ranks of cult classic, thanks to that time spent on Hulu streaming. In fact, Alan Tudyk, yes, that Alan Tudyk, recommended the show to the audience and praised Gillen by saying, I feel like if they'd given that show a real shot, Karen would have been getting Emmys. I don't know any other comedic actress on television that was delivering such a solid performance week after week after week. And fun fact... Apparently, Karen was doing Selfie and Guardians at the same time because she was wearing a red wig. That's right, because she shaved her head for Nebula in Guardians 1. Yep. 
Which and now this, is not a problem anymore because I think they've found ways to work around that. They did. And as recently as 2021, the show has been getting a cult following from as far as China. What? I didn't know the Chinese loved Karen Gillan so much. Who doesn't love Karen Gillan, though? It does. It's Karen Gillan. Why wouldn't they? Right. Yeah. They, must, they must really love Nebula. Yeah. Speaking of Karen Gillan and movies, uh, in a 2019 interview, Karen supported the idea of making a movie version of this show so that Henry and Eliza's story could have the proper closure. A closure that was not granted by ABC, Hulu, or Warner Brothers. Oh, that's right, because this is a Warner Brothers production, so... Hey, Warner Archive, release this on DVD and Blu-ray. We love and, Warner and, Archive here. And John Cho even went as far as saying, people still really miss and talk about Selfie. It goes by on my Twitter feed relatively frequently how much people miss it. He misses the show. He mentioned it was really fulfilling for him, and he had such a good time working on it. So there you go. Everybody loved working on it. People who rediscovered it over time have sort of began to follow it. But in 2014, nobody watched it, and it became a thing on TV. Hey, guys. Do you want to play What's a game? Up? <laughs> oh, no. Do you want to play no. a game of Amazon Price is Right? Oh, oh, Amazon Price is Right. Okay. Play the bill. The, we, get to, we get to hear the Bill Cullen theme. All right. That's, that's right. Okay, guys, you are going to be bidding on a Funko Pop of Amy Pond, and it's a 2018 Funko Spring Convention exclusive. Now, I'm going to share the photo in the chat. Okay. You see All it? Right. Yep. It's, yeah. Yeah. That's Amy Pond in the Kissagram outfit from the 11 Fowler. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. So, this could be yours. And I'm going to start the bidding with Mike. 2018 Spring Convention exclusive. This doesn't mean Comic-Con, does it? It could mean any convention. So. so it may not even be limited to one convention. It may have been something they gave away at 10. Yeah, at whatever conventions. Okay, okay I'm just at. trying to, to gauge the level of rarity this is. Okay, you know what? I'm going to say... Twenty nine ninety nine. Twenty nine ninety nine, Chico. I'm gonna go thirty nine ninety nine. All right, guys, are you ready for the price of this? Okay, it's gonna be about one hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, go. go what one thirty nine ninety five, Chico? Oh, wins. Get out of really here. close with one. Get out of oh here! You get yourself out of here right now. Not with my money. Oh, I you pay $139.95 for that. That's your money, bro. You make, you make better money than I do. But hey, guys, in our next episode, we talked about Nebula. Well, guess what? We're going to be talking about Thanos as a U.S. Senator from California. Oh, boy. But in the meantime, you can catch all of our episodes at ItWasAThingOnTV.com. Of course, we're talking about all the episodes, all the live watches, the mini-sodes, uh, links to our socials. Remember, we're on YouTube as well. Like, subscribe, hit that notification bell. Of course, 
you will be up to date with all of our installments, including an accidentally tributary memorial minisode we did last week of Walt Disney's Tidy, because we lost Gilbert Gottfried shortly after we recorded it. Yeah, but I gotta say, I appreciate, though, in the Tidy minisode that I inserted the clip from Wipe Swap of Gilbert singing the theme to Thick of the Night. Run it in the thick of the night. Run it in the thick of the night. Okay, this is the first time I'm hearing that Gilbert Gottfried was on Wife Swap. Yeah, him oh, and yeah. Helen were on Wife Swap. You didn't know this? I did not know this. <laughs> he sang the theme to Thick of the Night. Yes! I'm, I'm done. I'm done. That's great. Well, well, I think we're all done here. So until next time, when we talk about Thanos going to Congress, this has been It Was a Thing on TV. Thanks for listening. For Mike, Greg, I'm Chico. Please be kind to each other, and we will see you for the next one. Wow! I'm trying to understand my own technology, and are, I have no clue. Well, we prefer to uh, try to find the amusement, the funny side of the real drama we do. We have plenty of drama. We have drama, plenty actually. of drama. By the way, late... which one is this one? Oh, yeah, that's the uh, Thick of the Night thing. No, he you didn't play this, this one, but I, I've heard it, though. So, Gilbert, tell me about Thick of the Night. It sucked to high heaven. <laughs> I remembered he wrote and sang the theme song to Think of the Night. And he would play the guitar and it was... Mammy doing these that lay down I'm on the road. Second verse. Running in the thing of the night. Running in the thing of the night. I think I get it, Gilbert. Running in the thick of the night. not stop singing that song. I think he thinks it's really funny, but you don't want to test my patience. Oh. <laughs> I'm Alan Thick. People know me as TV's dad. <laughs> You're gonna be part of the cast. You're gonna be on the ship. And be like the mighty cursing it players. And it's just gonna have a bunch of resident cast the zanies. <laughs>